Good evening. Berkeley, California, 1933, in a lab filled with curiosities, beakers, microscopes, Bunsen burners, and hundreds upon hundreds of books, sat an investigator who would go on to crack at least 2,000 cases in his 40-year career. Known as the American Sherlock Holmes, Edward Oscar Heinrich was one of America's greatest and first forensic scientists, with an uncanny knack for finding clues, establishing evidence, and deducing answers with a skill that seemed almost supernatural. Heinrich was one of the nation's first expert witnesses, working in a time when the turmoil of prohibition led to sensationalized crime reporting and only a small, systematic study of evidence. However, with his brilliance and commanding presence in both the courtroom and at crime scenes, Heinrich spearheaded the invention of a myriad of new forensic tools that police still use today, including blood spatter analysis, ballistics, lie detector tests, and the use of fingerprints as courtroom evidence. His work, though not without its serious, some would say fatal flaws, changed the course of American criminal investigation. Based on years of research and thousands of never-before-published primary source materials, American Sherlock captures the life of the man who pioneered the science our legal system now relies upon, as well as the limits of those techniques and the very human experts who wield them. The book that we're featuring this evening is American Sherlock, Murder, Forensics, and the Birth of American CSI with my special guest, journalist and author and documentary producer, filmmaker, is Kate Winkler Dawson. Kate Winkler Dawson will join us in a 15 minutes and in the interim. Now, this is an interview with Kate Winkler Dawson that has decided to do a flurry of a media today. So this is one of the, one of the exclusive places where you can get and speak to and listen to uh, Kate Winkler Dawson talking about her latest book, American Sherlock. And so I will, well, as we await for Kate Winkler Dawson to join us, I'm going to have the great privilege of reading the prologue, which will introduce Oscar Heinrich, Edward Oscar Heinrich, and a fitting introduction to the stories that Kate Winkler Dawson will tell us about, some of the fascinating stories of Oscar Heinrich's life. This is Tales from the Archive, Pistols, Jawbones, and Love Poetry. His upper jawbone was massive, a long curved bone with nine tiny holes meant to hold his teeth. The remainder of his skeleton was blackened by a fairly large fire ignited by anonymous killer. Lifting up the jawbone, she examined the small blades of grass that adhered to its exterior, organic evidence from his hillside grave in El Cerrito in Northern California. It was distressing to hold a bone that had belonged to a murder victim, particularly one who was never identified. Kate glanced over at the archivist. Lara Michaels, who quietly stood across the wooden desk inside the massive warehouse. What's next? Kate asked. She led Kate down a long row of large cartons, one more than 100 boxes donated by the same owner. She had been given exclusive access to a trove of material collected over five decades by a brilliant man a forensic scientist and criminalist from the first half of the 20th century, a man who changed how crimes were solved before forensics became the foundation of most criminal cases, America's Sherlock Holmes. She walked along the tight corridor, scanning the labels on the cardboard boxes for a common name, Edward Oscar Heinrich. When Heinrich died in 1953 at the age of 72, his youngest child, Mortimer, waited 16 years to donate the contents of his father's laboratory, a bastion of forensic history that once monopolized the ground floor of Mortimer's childhood home in Berkeley, California. 
in 1968, he bequeathed his father's many boxes containing case files, evidence, personal diaries, letters, even romantic poetry to the University of California at Berkeley, Oscar's alma mater, and the college where he spent years teaching forensic science. The archive was an incredible repository of information, but given the university's limited budget for archival material and research, the collection remained uncatalogued and untouched for more than 50 years. In 2016, she discovered Oscar Heinrich hidden in a short article that lauded one of the most famous cases, the Siskiyou train robbery of 1923. She was astonished that no contemporary author had penned a book about him. She requested that UC Berkeley open his collection for research. Michaels agreed, and after more than a year of waiting, she began to immerse herself in the bizarre world of Oscar Heinrich, the most famous criminalist you've likely never heard of. The boxes contain more than 100,000 pieces of information, such as photographs, notes, letters, sketches, and trial transcripts. It was an overwhelming and disorganized collection that was housed in the school's off-site processing center. Heinrich seemingly kept everything from his life, personal and professional, manically collecting notes written on napkins, thousands of newspapers, hundreds of bullets, and financial journals. Kate began jokingly describing him as a productive hoarder until her colleague, a psychology professor at the University of Texas, suggested that he had in fact fit the diagnostic criteria for obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which occurs in just 1% of the population. People with OCPD have a preoccupation with perfectionism, control and order, a neat life. They are frequently extremely productive and successful, but their personal relationships often suffer because their rigidity can manifest itself in righteousness, even anger when their control is threatened. Heinrich's already stressful life was certainly complicated by his OCPD, but as an author and researcher, Kate was thankful for his fastidious habit of adding constantly to his collection. She was particularly grateful for the numerous boxes of evidence he had preserved from criminal cases. The evidence was plentiful, spanning investigations and unraveled over decades. The archivist allowed her to examine pieces from a detonated bomb, a locket owned by a dead woman who was run down by her own car, a lock of hair belonging to an actress who died during an infamous party, and several pistols that required having their firing pins removed by UC Berkeley police. As she picked up the first photo, she was struck by something that seemed like an odd observation at the time. Heinrich was quite handsome for a tightly wound scientist. He was slight and not particularly tall, with thinning light brown hair. There was something about the sharp angles of his face that made him magnetic in photos, a confidence in his eyes as he cleaned a revolver. Kate spent months staring at thousands of photographs, some taken by Heinrich's assistants and others developed by the criminalist himself. He was an avid photographer who relished documenting crime scenes. Kate noted hundreds of details like the way he squinted as he adjusted the focus knob on his favorite microscope, the way his teeth gripped the bit of a straight stem pipe as a small stream of smoke billowed from its bowl the way his forehead wrinkled as he hunched over evidence, the way his round rimless glasses fit extra snugly around his temples, a requirement for a chemist who spent much of his time leaning over a microscope. As Kate flipped through these portraits, she gleaned more details about his private lab in Berkeley Hills, a lovely neighborhood overlooking San Francisco Bay. Heinrich was surrounded by odd devices, Every conceivable type of microscope was crammed onto a long wooden desk. Any extra space was surrendered to test tubes, crucibles, beakers, lenses, and scales. Behind Heinrich were shelves filled with hundreds of priceless books, at least priceless to a chemist turned forensic scientist. There were tomes on fingerprint identification, applied mechanics, 
analytical geometry and powdered vegetable drugs. These, the titles written in six different languages would intrigue any intellectual. Blood, urine, feces, and moisture, a book of tests, read one cover. Arsenic in papers and fabrics, read another. He even owned a tattered dictionary of slang used by criminals. They seemed unrelated, a cache of mismatched textbooks in the library of a brilliant madman, but each was a tiny piece belonging to a bigger puzzle that only he could assemble. The portrait of a genius and the tumultuous era in which he lived began to emerge. And it was a tumultuous era. The homicide rate in the 1920s when Heinrich, Heinrich's most interesting work began had increased by as much as almost 80% from the decade before thanks to prohibition. For 13 years, the federal government banned alcohol in hopes of reducing crime. But instead, it spawned new and more creative criminal enterprises. Varying levels of corruption tainted local governments and police departments across the country. Judges enjoyed immunity from arrest, and most major cities were ruled by crime bosses. Poverty and unemployment were also responsible for the increase in violent crimes, as many Americans became desperate for security and safety, and there was an ever-growing backlog of unsolved crimes. B.I. was still the Bureau of Investigation, a group of insufficiently trained officers who mostly investigated bank fraud. Local police forces were underfunded, poorly instructed, and mostly using investigative techniques that hadn't been updated since the Victorian era. There would be no public federal crime lab until 1932. Violent bank robberies increased while murderers terrorized Americans, especially women, whose newfound independence inflamed both the passions and the anger of many in society. The archaic methods of crime fighting in the 1920s, procedures depending on hunches and weak circumstantial evidence, were futile. Cops were combating a sneakier criminal, those thieves and murderers who understood chemicals, firearms, and the criminal court system. Police were outmanned and many times outsmarted. Footprints are the best clue, declared one top cop at the time. There's no need for any type of any other type of identification. Innocent men were being hanged while criminals escaped justice. The complicated crimes of the 20s demanded a special type of sleuth, an expert with the instincts of a detective in the field, the analytical skills of a forensic scientist in the lab, and the ability to translate that knowledge to a general audience in a courtroom. Edward Oscar Heinrich became the nation's unique crime scene investigator, one of America's greatest forensic scientists, a criminalist who cracked some of the country's most baffling cases. Ladies and gentlemen, author of American Sherlock, Kate Winkler Dawson. Welcome to the program, and thank you very much for agreeing to this interview, Kate Winkler. Hi, Dan. How are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. I just took the liberty of reading your prologue, where you discuss everything about coming into uh, your possession, these incredible uh, information material from, from Edward Oscar Heinrich. Now, I've done that introduction to let our audience know a little bit about how you came upon these materials and an introduction on who exactly Edward Oscar Heinrich was. Uh, now with this, let's talk about two of the cases that you say in your book shaped his career, shaped his reputation, and are two of the fascinating cases that Oscar Heinrich was inextricably involved. Let's talk about May 30th, 1933, and a case you call a bloody mess, and David Lamson uh, in Palo Alto, California. Tell us a little bit about this incredible case and Oscar Heinrich's involvement. Well, in this book, I start with this case and I end with this case. So the book ranges from, uh, you know, Oscar worked from 1910 until 1953, so over 40 years. And I picked uh, a time period that I thought would be really fascinating, which is Prohibition, Roaring Twenties, and then, uh, you know, through the Great Depression. 
And so I started with this Lamson case, and I end with the Lamson case because I wanted to sort of uh, set the stakes early. So I wanted you to know who David Lamson was and, you know, why he depended on Oscar Heinrich so much as his expert in his murder case. And then you go through the journey through five or six other cases of what Oscar's developments were personally and professionally. And then we end again with the Lamson case at the end of the book so that we can see what the results were. And so the David Lamson case was fascinating. And I'll just kind of give you a, a you know, a little brief uh, bit. Uh, you know, Heinrich was this professional forensic scientist. By the time 1933 came around, he had solidified his reputation as America's Sherlock Holmes because he knew so many disciplines in forensics. So biology, botany, handwriting, uh, bloodstain pattern analysis, ballistics, chemistry. It was really a pretty incredible toxicology. It was a very long list. So he could walk into a crime scene and he could determine any number of tests that he was able to run that very uh, a few other people knew, you know, this amount of tests. And that, you know, would not just solve the crime, but really re rebuild the crime. What happened? And so by this point, he has a pretty incredible reputation. So the prosecutor who hired him was really leaning on him to solve this case. So the case is of a man named David Lamson, who was kind of an account executive um, at Stanford University Press in Palo Alto, California. He was good-looking, young, and he was married to a beautiful woman named Aileen Lamson, who you know, had a master's degree, which was pretty unusual for uh, anyone, let alone a woman, in the 1920s and 30s. And um, she, they had a little girl. And uh, Memorial Day week in 1933, which we're referring to, uh, the Lamsons had decided they were going to go to a slew of parties, um, and they had a great time, and they sent the little girl to go uh, spend several nights with a grandmother, and so David and Eileen could be alone. And they came home Sunday night, so the night before Memorial Day, and Eileen was not feeling well. She came home late and from one of their parties, and she went to bed with a stomach ache, and David kind of helped her throughout the night, and the next morning he wanted to do some yard work, and uh, she wanted to take a bath, so he drew her a bath, and he went outside of their small cottage, which was in a very affluent area. It was not a big house, but it was in an affluent area called um, Faculty Row, where they bought this cottage. So he went into the garden and started a bonfire and started clipping all of the fruit trees they had in the backyard, like blackberry bushes and apple trees. And his neighbors were all kind of around him, and everybody was gossiping and chatting. It was just a, a nice, you know, cool morning. The Lampsons were planning to rent out their cottage for the summer because their young daughter was having a lot of sinus infections, and they wanted to take her to the mountains. The doctor thought it might help her. And so they were renting out the cottage. And a real estate agent that morning popped her head over and said, listen, I rang the doorbell. Your wife didn't answer. I'd like to bring in a client. I'm sorry we don't have an appointment. And David was startled, but he said, sure. And he put on his T-shirt, said goodbye to the neighbors, let the bonfire continue to burn. And he went into the back and said, meet me at the front of the house and I'll let you in. And he finds his wife dead in the bathtub. And there's blood everywhere, on the floor, all over every wall, on the ceiling. And the coroner would later say that Aileen was a very felt young woman. She was, you know, 120 pounds at the most. And uh, he said, the coroner would say that she lost about half of her blood, which is a lot. And she was laying in the bathtub and he screamed and the real estate agent comes in and within about 15 to 20 minutes, he is under arrest for murder. And this begins an incredibly high profile controversial case because Oscar Heinrich comes in uh, is hired by the prosecution. He walks into the house, and the prosecutor says, listen, this guy beat his wife to death. And Oscar looks at the blood on the walls. He looks at the blood pattern. 
He looks to see if there's a, a void in the blood spray. Was there somebody behind her that would have blocked the blood? And he comes back out and resigns from the prosecutor's case and calls the defense. And that's where the story goes. And then it's a it's a big who done it? What happened? Did, did she slip and fall? Or did he beat her to death? And it became a massive case in not just in California, but it was an international story. What were the forensic innovations or the forensic evidence that he brought forward in that trial? It was really bloodstain pattern analysis. And so what's interesting about that case and in starting and ending with that case is that I wanted to be clear in the book that, you know, Oscar did a lot of firsts in forensics that were very important. He was the first to introduce forensic geology into a criminal case in America. He was the first to introduce forensic entomology, how bugs arrive to a crime scene in America. Um, you know, he was an innovator with handwriting analysis. He was the first to introduce bloodstain pattern analysis in the United States uh, eight years earlier in a different case. But not all of the science was good. And the science that he used, which was bloodstain pattern analysis, is junk science now. It's considered junk science. Um, there's an argument and certainly kickback from, from the experts in that community that, that differ, but um, it is um, unreliable. And it's really subjective and up to the analyst. So Heinrich used these tools, a bloodstain pattern. He had a little dial that was all based on trigonometry. So he used the measurements when, of, of the tails and the heads of the blood. So if you, in this case, we're just going to stick with Lampson's facts, which were the prosecutor claimed that David Lampson, in a fit of rage, took a metal pipe and beat his wife on the back of the head as she stood in the shower. And blood went everywhere. And if you could then look at the drips of blood. So, if, you know, you think of it as kind of an exclamation point, like there's a head and then there's a little tail. The experts say that you can look at those drops and you could tell how tall the perpetrator is, exactly where he was standing, where she was, was she sitting, was she standing, and all of that. And that should inform us who the killer is. And Heinrich did that. And what he determined... Um, which is going to totally ruin all of this. <laughs> what he determined was that she slipped and fell and hit her head on the sink. Um, there are other explanations. You know, I think there is a middle ground, and um, I think, you know, that there are other explanations you'll just have to read about in the book. But uh, the techniques that he used are currently used today, but they are dubious at best, and they are challenged in court. Um, and what you'll find with junk science that I'm sure your audience will be interested in is, is that there is, in many cases, not very much science in this forensic science and that experts overstate their importance in court. And that can sway a jury, and that's problematic. There's also very sound science that is rooted in scientific research, like toxicology, DNA analysis, but um, things like uh, bloodstain pattern analysis, um, there are aspects to it that are accurate. So void patterns. If somebody is standing behind a victim and beats them to death and blood comes backwards, well, the person who is the perpetrator is going to absorb the blood, right? The blood's going to go all over their clothes. It's not going to go on the wall right behind them because they're blocking the wall. So in Aileen Lanson's case, every wall, every part was covered with blood spatter. So nobody was standing right behind her, beating her to death. But there's so many mysteries in this case and how it unfolds and does, was he guilty? And, you know, does Oscar have any doubts about his guilt? And is he, you know, testifying on behalf of a guilty man? And what happens to David Lampson is also incredible. Yes. There are so many incredible stories. And as you say, progressively, you show the... Um, the controversy that uh, Heinrich is involved with and the luster goes off his reputation. Let's talk about the, the dual cases that created a lot of stress and anxiety for Heinrich in 1921, two cases going on concurrently. 
And these cases, again, are, are testing of this forensic methodology and the forensic science that he is employing. Tell us a little bit about right, and I, cases. Yeah, and I really, um, I spent time looking at cases that I thought would really illustrate as time moves on, the skills that he picks up, you know, the wins and the losses, so that you could see a development in his career and in his personal life kind of happening parallel. And then, you know, the overall arch of forensics in general and what's happening in that timeline. So the first case you're talking about was the Father Heslin case. And in the case of Father Heslin, it was a um, parish priest, you know, Catholic priest who was um, uh, met by a stranger at his home. And the stranger asked the priest in Pullman, California in 1921 to please come give last rites to a man who had tuberculosis. The stranger's friend was dying and he needed Father Heslin to come and please give him last rites. And Father Heslin agreed and left in the middle of the night. And he left behind a housekeeper who was very worried because the stranger was odd and um, had an odd accent and just was dressed strangely. And he was wearing driving goggles, which, you know, people who had open air touring cars in the 1920s wore, but it was foggy and rainy and in the middle of the night and no reason for this man to be wearing goggles. So she um, was was concerned. And when the priest didn't show up the next day, she called the archbishop who called the police. And thus began an incredibly complicated story about um, the kidnapping of a priest and, and sort of a nation waiting to see what was happening to this man who, you know, uh, Father Heslin just had a stellar reputation as, you know, a counselor and a spiritual guide. So this was heartbreaking for a lot of people. And um, Heinrich was brought in really to play second or third fiddle. Um, he was younger. This was the beginning. This is the first decade of his career in in uh, in you know law enforcement and scientific investigation. And so he was say, saying, you know, he was second or third fiddle to two other um, criminologists, criminalists who who had more experience than he did, and he thought were just charlatans. He just thought they were both jokes. So um, there are ransom letters that are coming in, partially typed and partially handwritten, which was odd. The amount of the, um, I can't remember the exact amount of amount of the um, ransom, but it was something like $6,500, where you would yeah. think that they would round up or down. Yeah. So the whole thing was really odd. And so, you know, you he, they, the uh, archbishop and the cops brought in these two experts in handwriting analysis who were also experts in what's called graphology, which is, um, you know, a junk science and, and really was yeah. never taken that seriously, even in the 20s. And they predicted, you know, that this man was... Um, you know, uh, uh, demented, but really, you know, they couldn't give any more details at all. And what Oscar said was, if you look at his handwriting, he said, I have no idea who this man is. I don't know his identity, but I do know when you find him that if you ask him what he does for a living, then he'll say he was a professional baker. And the cops, first of all, said, well, how is that at all helpful? I mean, how many bakers are there? And he said, listen, I'm just telling you a little bit more information and let's continue to move forward and we'll get closer to identifying him. But the reason that Oscar talked about that was because he really believed in profiling and very little profiling was done in the United States. It was done after the person was caught as a way to determine whether or not he should stand trial. Is this guy crazy or not? Is what a judge wanted to know. So then they would profile him and, and try to sort that out. But very little was done before the person was caught, and Oscar was one of the first to do it. So Oscar's belief, which was true, is that a baker is a baker. If he turns into a murderer, that doesn't mean he's not a baker any longer. So he was able to look at this man's writing and say only someone who is professionally trained as a baker would make loops like this this is how you, you, you know, do you know, writing on a cake. It's just the way right. you have to do it on a cake. 
And so this was a profile. This was actually real. This was not just handwriting comparison. This was a habit that Oscar had picked up on. It's like a murderer who has a cat, and you find that fiber, you know, that cat hair. So he's right. still a pet owner, even though he's a murderer. And they, and these are habits. You can pick up all the spent shells you want. You can wipe down all the fingerprints you want and, you know, make sure that you shave your head and make sure you're not leaving behind any hair. But you still have habits that none of us can break. And um, so as as this, this went on, um, finally, just out of, of, I don't know if it's luck, they had a suspect um, named William Hightower. And much of what happened with William Hightower was determining whether he was sane or not sane. And I think it's pretty clear that he was not sane um, as you sure. get closer into the story. And Oscar was also the one who encouraged the very first use of the lie detector of the polygraph in a criminal court case, in this particular court case. And we now know that the polygraph is inaccurate, that there are many reasons why people pass it or don't pass it. It can do with, they have to do with your medication, with your emotions that day, with your mental health. I mean, there's too many variables. And in forensic science, that is the key. That's the word to underline is variable. Because in handwriting, your handwriting is not identical all the time. There are variables. Fingerprints, the same thing. Your fingerprint doesn't change, but the quality of the fingerprint that you leave behind does change. And so this was something that it was just occurring to people in this time period. So Oscar was able to kind of really crack this case and tie William Hightower definitively to this case using grains of sand and forensic geology, using some handwriting analysis, you know, but particularly nailing down the profile of this person. And that, I think, is what he was great at, shoring up the case for the prosecutor of the defense. Absolutely. Let's use it as an opportunity to just stop for a second to talk about our sponsor, Third Love. Third Love uses the measurements of millions of women to design bras with all-day comfort and support. The perfect fit promise, 60 days to wash it and wear it. If you don't love it, returns are always free. Bras in over 80 sizes, including half cups, all made with signature memory foam. My wife, Lisa, Lisa, immediately went and took Third Love's Fit Finder quiz. It took her just a minute, and she ordered her 24-7 classic t-shirt bra. She said, and I agree, the bra was very flattering, and she remarked it was very comfortable. It fit perfectly, she said. She answered a few simple questions based on breast size, weight, and fit issues. Hands down the most comfortable bra you'll ever own. Hands the straps that won't slip and tagless labels, no itching. Super thin memory foam mold to your shape. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash truemurder to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash truemurder for 15% off today. Now, Kate, you were talking about this case in 1921, but as I mentioned, there was a, a concurrent case going on at the same time. And as you write in the book, how interesting was the media at that time? What was their response at that time and their ethical boundaries at that time to, uh, in terms of accuracy? Tell us a little bit about the media and the media's response to these two trials in 1921. Well, the second trial, uh, as you mentioned, it was that of Fatty Arbuckle, who was a very, very famous silent film star um, in the 1920s. And um, in 1921, he was capturing headlines because he had just wrapped up um, uh, his latest movie. He had a movie currently uh, playing in theaters that was doing really well. He was the highest paid actor in Hollywood at the time. He was on the top of the world. I mean, really, I mean, it was an incredible year for him. And so his friend decided to throw him a party at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, which was a really swanky hotel. And uh, there were men from Hollywood there. There were showgirls there, kind of as entertainment and companionship. And there was a, a minor actress there named Virginia Rapay. And she and Fatty Arbuckle got along well. And um, a few days after the party, she ends up dead. 
she had a chronic condition that was exasperated when you drink kind of, you know, bathtub gin. And then again, we're in the middle of prohibition at the time. And um, she ends up dead. Fatty Arbuckle is arrested for a manslaughter and potentially for a sexual assault. And he goes on trial. And the reaction of the press of both of these cases, um, you asked about ethical boundaries. There seem to be very few, if, if yeah. any at all, boundaries. And this yeah. is, we see this with what we call yellow journalism. You know, this is the rise of uh, William Hearst papers the rise of the tabloid journalists. But really, I say that, and, and in some ways that's not true, because if you read the Penny Dreadfuls from the 1800s, you know, that were about Jack the Ripper, uh, you know, and, and, and any of these stories um, in Victoria and England, I mean, boy, they sure did love a good murder, and particularly if it involved a celebrity. And the Fatty Arbuckle trial was pretty incredible. Um, you know, there were people who, of course, defended him, and then there were the the religious right who who uh, were incredibly critical of Hollywood. It was sort of a country divided in some ways. And Oscar Heinrich was one of those people. He really uh, disliked Hollywood. He believed in some ways that women should continue to wear corsets and there should be chaperoning. He was sort of old-fashioned, which was interesting. It was an interesting choice of career for him because he, of course, you know, had to deal with what he would consider to be the dregs of society. And um, so the Fatty Arbuckle case was the first case that I read where I really felt that he had, for me, an uncomfortable bias because in his letters to his best friend and to his son and to his wife, he just talked about how disgusted he was in general with Hollywood and with Hollywood stars and the opulence and um, with flapper women. And then particularly with Fatty Arbuckle, uh, he just felt like this was not, he was not conducting himself in the way a man should, a right man should. And so um, it became very clear to me early on that... Heinrich had to have felt very, very comfortable with his evidence, and it was fingerprinting evidence, which is the reason why, if you look at the front cover of the book, it's a handprint, and that's actually right. Fatty Arbuckle's handprint, and, the, and, and Oscar took it. Oscar went to the San Francisco jail and with the ink pad and rolled it and, you know, to then took a photo of it, and I think that that handprint's really important because that was sort of the beginning of his reputation. It was solidified with the Siskiyou train robbery two years later, but he be made headlines for months because he dragged this out for months. His testimony and his expertise continued to hang the jury and continued to trigger mistrials because the jury believed at least one person in each trial believed his evidence. And fingerprint evidence is just not accurate. And it wasn't accurate. If you look at some of the photos in the book, it wasn't it wasn't even remotely accurate in this case. Um, and on top of that, you know, you've got the coroner who's saying, listen, we don't really know what caused her death, but it wasn't just Fatty Arbuckle on trial. It was Hollywood on trial. It just, it was. It was a country divided. And um, so, you know, the headlines were just incredible. I mean, they certainly damned Fatty Arbuckle right out of the gate. And um, so it was quite a spectacle. It was the trial of the century, for sure. It was definitely an OJ scenario, you know, with that that sort of salacious reporting. You talk about that trial as well and the interesting behavior of the district attorney when he has these confl conflicting testimonies of these showgirls. He just gets him into the room and says, you're going to change, you're going to make new statements. But that's kiboshed right. at that yeah. trial and, and leads and, and helps uh, Fatty Arbuckle to a certain degree. Of course, as you mentioned, too, his career is absolutely ruined as of that point, so he has no career. Yeah. Very interesting that you call this Sherlock Holmes and the parallel to this fictional character, but also very much like the fictional character, he has nemesises, and he also has, well, at least one, Cha Chauncey McGovern in particular. Uh, but John Boynton Kaiser, tell us about this John Boynton Kaiser and his contribution um, and his role as a, I guess, a Watson 
Kaiser. Yep, yeah, John Point and Kaiser. Yeah, John Point and Kaiser was a uh, reference librarian that uh, someone who Oscar had become friends with decades earlier in Tacoma, and they became friends. And when Oscar moved to Berkeley, uh, you know, they began writing each other, which was great because now I have. Um, Kaiser was a big deal in in the library world, and so I have all of his letters because he had his own collection at UC Berkeley. And then Oscar kept all of his letters. So again, I'm able to to build these conversations between these two men. And it became clear to me really quickly that Kaiser was a confidant. He was a, a close, close friend. He was a sounding board, and he was an advisor. So the majority of the books that Oscar used in his cases, I would guess 90% came from Kaiser. And Kaiser would send him unsolicited. He would send them books. He would just say, hey, I know you're doing the Fatty Arbuckle case. Here's another one on fingerprinting that I think you could use. Uh, Kaiser would ask his opinion. Um, your uh, Oscar would ask Kaiser's opinion about cases. And then Kaiser would give him unsolicited advice, which is all important. But I think that John Boyton Kaiser's most important role was listening because Oscar had an incredible ego publicly, but privately he was very, very insecure. He was constantly in fear of losing cases. He was constantly in fear of being ridiculed on the stand by either a prosecutor or a defense attorney or another witness, and that happened quite a lot, you'll see in the book. And, of course, he was constantly in fear of um, debt collectors and lenders coming after him, which also happened throughout his life. So all of this comes together in that there are very few people he can trust, including his wife. He does not tell his wife about his financial problems. He doesn't disclose that. He says it's his honor to protect her from things like this. But he tells everything to Kaiser. And so I think that, you know, Kaiser served in a professional capacity, sort of like a Watson, but really it's the personal. It's the Kaiser knew him better than anybody. And so I think that that was so incredibly important to Oscar to have that best friend. And and that's where the, his key role really is. Just with this book, you talk about all of the, um, the court cases that he's involved with, again, inextricably involved because they rely on him. What are the, what are the things that affected him uh, in terms of the, we talked about, I, I mentioned the nemesis, this person that was this uh, graphologist, and he vehemently disagreed with this guy, and he was, this, he was the first fiddle, or uh, at least he was, uh, that he was the second fiddle to this person that he dis vehemently disagreed with. What is the kind of criticism that eventually uh, categorized his career? What were some of the things and some of the uh, contentious things that were he was alleged to have done in his career that marred that reputation and and definitely contributed for him to be lost somewhat um, in history. Well, I think that the reason he lost in history, I think, was a, a couple of things. One is that forensic scientists generally work in the background. I mean, let's face it, you don't know much about forensic science, you know, famous forensic scientists. There aren't the people who are in Wikipedia. I mean, the most famous people work very quietly behind the scenes. They're not the police. They're not the DAs who are, you know, in front of the cameras or in newspapers generally. And he also didn't have a big case um, that was turned into a TV or a, a TV show or a movie like Paul Kirk, who saw the Sam Shepard case, you know, that was turned into The Fugitive with Harrison Ford or you know, Ga uh, Calvin Goddard, who solved the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So, you know, these are cases that become well-known only because of Hollywood, not because of the forensic scientists necessarily. Uh, what Heinrich really was accused of, I think the most, what's most, the most telling and the most entertaining, I think, was um, when Chauncey McGovern, who was probably his main competitor, Decades after they became competitors, they were testifying in the same uh, criminal case, and uh, Heinrich had just come up with this new technique in order to photograph two bullets side by side. 
So when you fire a bullet through a gun, the interior of uh, the gun makes markings, which are called bullet striations. It's unique markings to the gun specifically. So what Heinrich would do was he would take a bullet from a crime scene, either from, you know, it would be from a person or from a bullet fired through the wall. He would take that bullet and then he would take a um, clean bullet, fire it through the suspect's gun, and then he would uh, fire it into wax, dig it out, clean it off, and then he could put the bullet side by side and see if the markings matched up. It's a very valid scientific technique that's still used today. And so what Heinrich did was take it a step further. Not only was he able to, you know, match these markings up, but he was able to photograph it through a comparison microscope, which nobody had ever done before. And he could blow up the photographs, and he took them in and um, to the courtroom and showed them to the jury. And this is, you know, definitive evidence that the suspect had used the gun to shoot and kill his boss. But... Chauncey McGovern, who was the um, expert on the other side of the table, and they just hated each other beyond belief. Chauncey McGovern got on the stand and essentially um, accused him of 19th, you know, eight, uh, 20th century photoshopping, essentially. You know, what would you, in the 1900s, how would you, you know, early 19, oh, it, like, he accused him of, of photoshopping kind of in the 1920s. So he's fabricating this photo. And it came very close to breaking Oscar. He was humiliated and embarrassed. But then he picked himself up very quickly, and he whispered to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor said, let's let him bring in his setup. And so he did, and he took it through the, the jury, and the jury came, and they looked through the microscope, and they said, okay, these, these do look similar, but the jury was convinced the bullets were the same, but they weren't 100% convinced that Oscar knew how to photograph these bullets. And so it's almost like it was case closed, but, well, are you really lying about this photography thing? And so they made him take a photo then and there, and they sent a bailiff with him to watch him develop the photo so he wasn't double exposing anything and then bringing it back in. And so really Oscar was accused of falsifying information. It was really in that particular case where that came up. Um, you know, but I think that overall he was um, very, very well respected. It's later on, not the man, but the science that is doubted. Absolutely. Now you talk about what's interesting is that he was totally convinced whether this turns out to be later junk science, discredited uh, methodologies, and sciences, he was totally convinced. There is no evidence that he helped anybody, any prosecution out when he was not convinced, was there? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, he he was, as much as he could, he was honest in his techniques. The problem is now we know that his techniques, techniques weren't all valid. And that is not a reflection necessarily on Oscar, it's a reflection on the times. There wasn't time to test these techniques the way they should have been through peer reviews, you know, through war research, through rigorous testing that's supposed to be done. There wasn't, it, this was the beginning of it. So yes, there are going to be mistakes. So, um, you know, that, that really was sort of a growing pains of forensics. In the end, what are the most credible, or now we would consider credible, innovations in forensic investigation that he can be credited for? Well, certainly he was an innovator in ballistics with the photography. He was the first to use forensic geology and move that forward, the first to use forensic entomology, so how bugs arrive to a crime scene. He moved that forward, criminal profiling, um, and toxicology, he used an awful lot of toxicology in his cases. So there were um, a lot of very valid techniques that he used. Um, the questionable ones are, you know, fingerprinting, which who didn't use fingerprinting, and, and still many people do, and bloodstain pattern analysis um, were kind of the two big ones, I think, for him. As well, would you say that... Uh that he would be responsible for 
he had a great interest in policing. So along with his buddy, uh, Vollmer, he did make some significant changes along with that, his partner, Vollmer. What are the kinds of things that he made sure that were instituted? Um, hey, Dan, this is going to need to be my last question because I've got to take a little break before I have another big interview. Um, so I'm sorry, repeat that again, The the um, along with Vollmer? Well, with Vollmer, he was very interested in policing. So what are the things that he instituted with in the cooperation with uh, Police Chief Vollmer? Well, uh, you know, Vollmer was nicknamed the um, the grandfather of modern policing. And uh, Vollmer learned a lot from Oscar about organizing evidence. And he and Vollmer created the first criminology classes in the country, which, you know, was at UC Berkeley. And first it was only police officers who were allowed to attend the classes, and then it became more of the general public. So they worked together on those classes that became incredibly important. And Oscar spent decades at UC Berkeley. After that, um, Vollmer and Oscar worked on the Father Heslin case where Oscar uh, encouraged Vollmer to use a lie detector test. Now, Oscar didn't wasn't the creator of it. He wasn't the innovator. He thought it was a good idea. But again, this is the beginning of um, just an understanding of how to catch criminals. And we now know that the polygraph is not accurate, and it shouldn't be used in court. There's a reason why it's an admissible in court. But right. um, Oscar at the time thought it was it was a good way to catch William Hightower in a lie. Absolutely. I want to thank you very much for coming on and talking about American Sherlock, murder, forensics, and the birth of American CSI. Kate, for those that might want to take a look at this, is there a website, Facebook page? Tell us a little bit more about how they might take a look at this. Sure. There's my website, which is katewinklerdawson.com. So my name, .com. I have a newsletter. You can just put your email address. It's really easy, and you can kind of keep up with other projects that I'm doing and on this book. And um, on that page, if you scroll down, you'll be able to see, you know, all the places that you can buy the book. And then I'm on Facebook under my name, Kate Winkler Dawson, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram. It's been a fascinating uh, interview. Thank you very much for talking about Edward Oscar Heinrich and the American Sherlock. Thank you very much. You have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Dan. Good night.